Welcome, everyone. It's a great um, honor to introduce Sharon Eubank to you today. Sharon grew up in the wonderful city of Bountiful, Utah, <laughs> um, and is a graduate of, of Brigham Young University, and served a mission in the Helsinki, Finland mission. Sharon, I know, has had a, a wonderful and varied career. She um, worked in, in, in the bowels of the Capitol, in, in Capitol Hill, and working for the, the um, congressional leadership there for a little while. She was an entrepreneur, um, working in an um, educational toy store. Um, for the past several years, she's worked in different positions for the church. She is currently um, the director of LDS Charities. You may have seen her a couple weeks ago when there was a forum with um, Baroness Nicholson. She had Sharon's picture up there saying what a wonderful person she was. <laughs> and um, Sharon also re um, has been a featured um, women's conference speaker. Um, not long ago gave a talk um, on women in the church that went viral and she came out, became pretty much a celebrity after that. So um, it was very interesting, very, um, so uh, some of you may have seen it. Um, Sharon is a wonderful um, speaker, as, as you'll see, a uh, wonderful writer, lyricist, and even singer, but we won't have you sing today unless you'd like to. <laughs> so it is uh, my pleasure to ha introduce you to Sharon Newbank. Well, I told your technical people I hate standing behind the podium because I feel constrained. And he said, you must stand behind the podium. So I'm sorry that I am here. But I'm really glad to be here with you. And I'll just tell you straight out, I was not the greatest student at BYU. I was so shy that if I was late for a class or if I had to ask a question, I was, it was just incredibly painful for me to do that. And so I look at all of you, and, and I just want you to know, all of you are better than I ever was. So if I can do anything in this world, you will do 15 times better than that. Just take, take that from this, this event here today. The topic that I was given, as I understand your class, it's a little bit about career paths. It was to tell about where do I work and tell about how did I get there and then if I have any tips or counsel for you. So the first thing I thought I would show you is if you wanted to see what Professor Wilson looked like when he was your age, <laughs> that's him. <laughs> That's him in a paddle boat where I did none of the paddling and he had to do all of the paddling in the Potomac outside the Jefferson Memorial. <laughs> yes, let's turn dim the light so you can actually get a very good look. <laughs> uh, Dr. Wilson and I came home from Finland where we both served our missions at the same time. We happened to be seated in the airplane next to each other. And so we were coming home from a mission that didn't have a huge amount of success and uh, so we were kind of processing that home on the plane and so it's fun for me to see him now after all this time and uh, I would tell you that even though our mission was not easy it was a huge impact in my life I learned to stop being shy on a mission and uh, I learned a lot about when things don't work out exactly as you plan what do you do then which has been pretty helpful for me in my life um, I started my career at BYU. I, as I said, wasn't the sharpest tool in the drawer. That's me in that red Bountiful Braves shirt that I was still wearing at BYU with some of my roommates. I studied English. I decided to study English. And when I left BYU, I could talk a lot about literature. But I didn't have any really practical skills. The one practical skill that I had was that I could write. I had learned to write here. And, and so, you know, I did what a lot of people do. I graduated, and my parents were so proud, and I, I got my diploma, and then I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> what, I have to get myself a job, and what am I going to do? So in something I won't talk about, I went to, to Japan, and I taught English in a, in a Japanese school. I was just buying myself time. I needed a year to figure out what am I really going to do, and so I, I made a little money. But when I came home to Japan, I had decided I'm going to move to Washington, D.C. So. I moved to Washington, D.C., and I didn't have any contacts, and I didn't have any network, and I had not taken the career class at BYU. It would have helped me. And so I went to the Senate Placement Agency, which a lot of people don't even know exists. And at that time, a long time ago, they gave you a typing test, and they uh, sent you out on these interviews, and they were offering me the fantastic salary of 14500 a year. <laughs> That's what it was uh, that you could work for a, a member of the House or the member of, of Senate. Anyway, I interviewed with Senator Al Simpson, who was the Republican whip at that time. And so the Democrats were in the majority, 
and Al was the whip to Bob Dole, who was the Republican leader. And they needed somebody who could write, and they liked the other Mormon that was in the office, and so they hired me, and I didn't know anything really about what they were doing. They would say, uh, what do you think about this legislation that's going to the floor? And I would think, I gotta get the Washington Post, I gotta study up about that. <laughs> But it was a wonderful opportunity for me to be there because we were in the hub of everything. And there were, there were Margaret Thatcher came and sat in, in our office and Lech Valenza, Poland had just become a, a, a free, free of communism and uh, different people came and, and I really felt like I was in a position to learn some things. So it was a wonderful chance for me to be there and I worked in the Senate for four years and a lot of legislation got passed. I learned a lot of things being there. It was, it was wonderful to, to know things and things that were coming up before the newspapers had done their analysis and, and I really felt like that was the, the finishing of my education. People were generous to me there. They gave me opportunities so that I could do uh, extra things. I remember George Bush Sr., who was the president at the time, saying, if you've done a job longer than two years, you're ready to move. And that was sort of the philosophy in the Senate. So they moved me around and gave me different opportunities, and that was great for me. When I left, oh yeah, that's me in front of the Senate steps, with sort of uncontrollable hair, but that's how it was. When I left the Senate, I started a business with a friend of mine. So now, if you're following my career path, I have gone from huge government, bureaucracy, to a two-person entrepreneurial store. So this is in Provo on the diagonal. There's a, what's over there now? It used to be the Albertsons shopping complex. There's all about pets. There's a tanning store. But it's on the diagonal from the fr freeway where you're coming up to BYU. And we owned a little 3,500 square foot toy store, educational toy store. And it was so opposite of working in the Senate because we could decide to do something at noon and we could implement that by two o'clock. It was so liberating. It was so wonderful to do that. We started on a shoestring. The people who had owned that space before I rented it was called, it was a f uh, formal dresses that you could rent and it was called the Queen's Closet. Well, I didn't have enough money to get my own signage so I took down the banner that said the Queen's Closet. I put it on my dining room table and I used a hair dryer to peel up all of the letters and then I rearranged them to say my store's name and then I glued the whole thing back together and put it back up because the landlords required that you have some kind of a sign. I owned the store for seven years and it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. That kind of a toy store runs on I remember your name and I remember that you bought a pogo stick for your seven-year-old's birthday and I ask when you come in, hey, how did John like the pogo stick? You know, it was all about personal relationships and you needed a good memory or you needed a good a system to do that. And I got to know just about everybody in Utah County. And that was a really fun thing for me. It was hard. You worked every holiday, you worked every Saturday, and in the beginning you did everything. We didn't have employees in the beginning. But it was, it was wonderful for me to, to have that kind of entrepreneurial experience and I loved it. In 1998, I sold my business and I used my Senate contacts to uh, get an interview at the US mission to NATO in Belgium. And so I traveled to Belgium and I had the interview and if you know about that, it's divided. The Defense Department has half of the mission and the State Department has the other half. And I had interviewed with the State Department. But as those things do, it takes a very long time and uh, they were you know, working on different uh, iterations. And so I, I had a long time. I knew I had five to six months to, before they would make the decision. And I thought, what am I going to do during this time? I'd sold the business. And so I went to the LDS church office building where my father's best friend said, hey, they're looking for people. And I went to the temp pool. And they said, can you do data entry? And I said, you bet. I can do data entry. And they sent me up to the welfare department. And I said, I'm just here temporarily, but what do you need done? And so they gave me a couple things to do. Well, as I was doing those things, a missionary couple comes in on the elevator and they say, we're here for our training. And there's this scramble in the back of, oh, man, we forgot they were coming. And, you know, so they put something together. And then a week later, a missionary couple comes up, a senior couple. Oh, they're here again. And I said, do you need somebody to put together some kind of curriculum for these couples who keep coming? They said, yeah, that would be great if you could do that. So I put together a little outline. And when the next couple came, they said, any possible way you could give them that training that you put together? So suddenly I was doing missionary training for the welfare department. They offered me a couple of jobs, and I was like, no, it's so nice of you, but I'm waiting for this, this other you know, opportunity to, to, to finalize. But finally, they offered me a job in humanitarian services as, a, as an analyst, as a shipping analyst. And I thought, 
before I turn it down, you know, maybe I better pray about it. So I prayed about this decision, as all of you will, and it was such a strong feeling. This is what you should do. And I thought, work at the church? This is what you want me to do? I had never, ever entered my mind that I would do that. And that was 17 years ago. I made that commitment saying, well, I'll stay for a couple years. I'll see how it goes. And 17 years later, I am still working at the church and loving every single minute of it. I've done your curriculum out of order. They asked me to please talk about where I work and then talk about how I got there. I just told you how I got there. But let me tell you where I work. I am the director of, oh, I actually have pictures. I'm the director of LDS Charities. And LDS Charities is the non-governmental organization of the humanitarian arm of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So in many countries where the church doesn't have a presence, LDS Charities is its governmental registration. It is an NGO, but it operates a little bit different than other NGOs. It is interesting. There are 22 employees in Salt Lake, and there are 15 employees out in the, in the different offices. So the church has area offices. There are 15 of them internationally, and every one of them has what's called an area welfare manager. They are staffed to the area presidency to do anything that is welfare, including humanitarian services. So there are 15 out in the field, there are 22 at headquarters, and then everybody else that is our workforce are volunteers or full-time missionaries. So there are 96 full-time missionaries, that's however many couples that is, 96, and they are on full-time missions and their job is to do humanitarian outreach, make connections with partners, a lot of what other NGO staff would do. And then we have about 500 part-time doctors, ophthalmologists, rehabilitation uh, therapists, wheelchair technicians. These are people who will go out and for a short amount of time, two weeks on their vacation, they will actually help us implement a project. And so we're using volunteers in a very distinct way, that, in a way that other NGOs don't use them. And I will get a call maybe once a week from a student that says, how can I work for you? How can I, how can I work? And so I just have to say, the NGO that the church is doing is pretty limited. We, we, we have 22 people and they don't turn over very often. And then we use volunteers in this very interesting way. But when we do hire, we are hiring people in the middle of their career. Because you don't want to come into the church system and then work your way up because you will only understand the church system and the church is extremely unique in the way it, it functions. Uh, and so we are looking for people who have had experience out with other NGOs or other government organizations or, or with technical corporations because they bring all of that experience and all of their network into the church. And that creates bridges out into the other communities. And particularly for humanitarian services that is is all about outward facing. You know, we, we aren't serving members of the church. The welfare department takes care of them. Our outreach is to people who are not of our faith. And so we really count on those kind of bridges. And if I was sitting in your class, I would want to know that. If I were looking for this kind of a career, figure out how to get that kind of experience and bring those networks back into uh, the church system if you're interested in those kind of things. Uh, another couple of interesting things. LDS Charities is funded by... Let me just ask you, do you know how LDS Charities got its start? This is our 30th anniversary. What was, you weren't alive, but what was happening in 1985 in the world that actually precipitated LDS Charities in its current form? Anybody know? What do you think? Aren't you smart? How did you know that? Uh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> There was a terrible famine in Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa. These are cyclical famines. They are associated with drought, and they happen all the time. But this one was particularly severe. And there was a BBC news reporter who took a film crew in there, and he took film of acres and acres of desperate people who had walked and walked to get to these feeding stations. And they are the classic pictures of starving Ethiopians, you know, kids with distended bellies and emaciated mothers trying to nurse their children. And in a time before there was anything that went viral, this seven-minute BBC got picked up by all the news agencies. And suddenly, all over the world, people are talking about this terrible famine. And then you start to get Michael Jackson, who has a, a, a concert of you know, aid, and they're trying to raise money. And you've got different rock groups putting these things together. And there are all kinds of people energized. 
Well, LDS people were energized about, and they started writing church headquarters. What could we do? What could the church do to help in this situation? So President Kimball at that time, and President Hinckley, who was really the energy behind it, they sent a letter out to all of the church. Uh, it was read over the pulpit, and it said, on January 27th, we ask everybody to fast. And your fast donations that you make, along with the sacrifice, the spiritual uh, pleadings for the Lord to bless these people, the money will be donated to this famine relief. Anybody know how much money was? I'll put you on the spot because you read the article. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ted. Six million dollars was raised at that time, which was sort of unheard of in the church. That was a lot of money, and people were very generous. Later on in 1985, President Reagan asked the United States to fast and donate towards famine relief. I don't know where he got the idea, but he did. And so again, the church fasted, the U.S. church fasted in November, and $4 million was raised. So now you have $6 million and $4 million, and the church is very... Uh, anxious to make sure that that is spent in accordance with the, the way it was given, under sacrifice, under consecration, most of it in very small you know, numbers, little children giving $5 and widows on their fixed income. Everybody is aware of how that money came in. So Elder Ballard, who was a brand new apostle, and Bishop Glenn Pace, a brand new member of the presiding bishopric, went to Ethiopia, and they were looking for partners on, on who has the same kind of values and who would spend the money in this kind of way. So they started working with uh, Catholic Relief Services. Our oldest partner in LDS Charities is Catholic Relief Services. And we've done lots and lots of projects with Catholics over the years. Another partner was called AfriCare. Another partner, International Red Cross and Red Crescent. And they were on the ground actually implementing food getting to the most vulnerable people. And so the church, church started those. It took, to spend the money responsibly, it took three or four years. But the people in the church kept giving additional money, and so the fund kept growing. And finally, there was a decision made that it won't be a one-off. We will actually have an institutional part of the church that will, will help in disaster response. So we started in disaster response. And over the years, that grew into a humanitarian outreach. And our guiding purpose is to relieve suffering and build self-reliance of people of any race, any nationality, any religion. So this is outreach to people who are not of our faith. And I feel a real testimony in the letter that President Kimball wrote to the church in 1985. It said, we feel that it is now time for our people to take a more, I'm paraphrasing it, but a more active role in the humanitarian outreach. And I feel like that was prophetic. That wasn't just for 1985. So. The institutional church is doing all of this, but it's an interesting dynamic in that every member of the LDS church is under baptismal covenant to also reach out on an individual basis. All of us contribute to what the big church is doing, but we're also, each one of us, trying to do things at an individual level. So you, as you walk around campus or in your, in your dorm or in your family or your community, you every day are looking to see, what can I do to relieve suffering? What can I do to build self-reliance and mourn with those that mourn and comfort those that stand in need of comfort? So this makes us very different than any other NGO because our, our leadership is different. The, the, the welfare council that guides my work and approves the budgets, that's profit seers and revelators. So that's different. It's also the Relief Society presidency who sits on our board. It's different than most of it is done by volunteers and not just like stuffing envelopes and passing out flyers that other people use volunteers to do. We're asking volunteers to, to pay their own way, to live in a country for two years and be our actual representatives with the government. So we have to have great representatives and we do. You can't imagine the quality of, of the couples that come. Lots of them have been professors from BYU. And they're very skilled at interfacing with governments and with other NGOs and designing projects and helping us. But the third most interesting thing is we are built up of people who are very disposed to volunteer their time because of their covenants. Now, other NGOs will come to Salt Lake and they'll tour and they say, seriously, how are you getting people to volunteer? Is there some kind of you know, incentive system, or do you actually pay them under the table, or do they get little buttons? What are you doing to get the quality of the volunteers that you have? And the answer is hard for them to understand. It's 
It's out of people's covenants. People do those kind of things out of their covenants. But that is not just exclusive to Mormonism. There are other very devoted people of faith around the world who will do things out of a covenant to God. And our mission is to connect with those people. So we do a lot of interfaith work because we are looking for anybody that has a relationship with God and wants to bless other people in the world. So I'm giving you kind of a pitch about LDS Charities, but I want you to know about it because it's part of you. You are all part of this church, and we all have a, a, a responsibility in this way. So I luckily get to be the face of LDS Charities, and, and I get sent to places like the United Nations where I was pretty petrified in that picture. It's hard to see, but I was very nervous to do that. I wanted to do a good job for the church, and I knew it would be recorded, and I knew it would be online, and I wanted to not let anybody down. But I'm so proud of the institution in the church that I belong to that says, hey, we're not just worried about taking care of ourselves. We are worried about anybody who is poor and vulnerable in the world. And we're trying to have programs to reach out to them in any way that we can. Now, everything that we do and all of the money that we spend every year, it's a drop in the bucket. There's so much need. And I think that it's been designed by heaven that way to force us into cooperation with other groups that maybe we would never have any kind of interaction with so that we weave a network of people who are caring for the poor out of faith. Not out of graft, not out of obligation, but people who do it because they recognize it, it could just as easily have been our lives. We could have just as easily been sent into that situation and that we need each other. The poor and the rich, if you want to call us that, we exchange things of value all of the time. And pretty soon it's hard to know who was the poor person, who was the rich person in this. There are four uh, guiding principles that, are, that happen in humanitarian services. And the first one is self-help. We don't just give things to people and just say, oh, you're so poor and you're, you're so sad and I'm going to give you this thing because that just creates victims. I just have reinforced again, you can't do anything. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. Why would you ever do that for somebody? So the projects that we design, the work that we do on an individual basis, it's always about what can you do? What are you prepared to do for yourself? And what are the things that you have no way of doing? And we'll help fill that gap. So the first thing is self-help. The second thing is work. Everything is about work. The welfare services started because you had a bunch of people out of work in the Depression and their marriages were falling apart because they were driving their spouses crazy. <laughs> they needed something to do. We all need meaningful work to do, every single one of us, no matter what our situation. The third thing is thrift. Thrift meaning don't waste anything. I think our Heavenly Father is beautiful at not wasting anybody's capacity. He's, he doesn't have anybody who says, well, not you. I'm going to use these other things, but I'm not going to use you. And I have to count on that as somebody who served a mission in a place where two years of work, and I didn't know if it was any worth anything. I didn't know if it had gone in vain. But the Spirit says to me, and he says to me in missions and work and everything else, there's nothing that's ever in vain. The economy of heaven says, I will use up everything thriftily so that there's always a place for something to use. And so we're always trying to involve the right kinds of people and, and be careful with the money and careful with people's time and careful with the strengths. And that's a wonderful thing. And the fourth principle is service. It is about going outside when you have absolutely, you're going to get nothing out of it. It's a pain to you. It causes you stress. It causes you conflict. But you are doing it because you care for other people. And that makes us better people. And that refinement process is good for everybody. So those are the four guiding principles of, of welfare work. And although in your government classes, everybody talks about sustainability and self-help self and, and all of those things, it's in practice extremely hard to do. And the only way it works is when people on the ground, there every day, show up, are completely committed to those principles. And that's why a faith-based structure works, because people are reinforcing those principles outside of the project. They're reinforcing those principles inside their life. Now, I've blabbed on too much about LDS Charities. I care so much about it, and I care about this work. And it isn't just an organization that I happen to be the director of. It's 
all of us, as members of the church, this is an extension of what we're trying to do as the church. The, the last part that I was asked to talk about was if I had any tips or counsel, which I'm not sure that I'm qualified to give. I told uh, Dr. Wilson, I don't think I have anything to offer this kind of a class. And he said, well, try and come up with something. So these are my three things that I've learned. The first one is, and this, this is true in just about any career, be willing to do whatever. Now, of course, we all believe that. Our parents have told us that, you know, just look around and see what needs to be done and then do that thing. But it's amazing to me how very few people know how to practice that skill. Be willing to do whatever. Let me give you a couple of examples. When I worked at the Senate, George Mitchell was the Democratic leader. Now, the Democrats were in power, and so every day, every morning on the Senate floor, he held a little bull session for reporters, and he was talking about what he was going to bring up on the floor next and the schedule, and he's, he's opining, and it was sort of an opportunity for him to kind of, you know, use it as a platform, as a bully pulpit to kind of talk about what he was going to do, and the reporters were all there. And my office said, we need somebody who could just like eavesdrop on that because if he sees the Republicans there, he, he won't be as frank. But if nobody's around, he often talks about things. We need somebody that nobody cares about. Sharon, how about you? <laughs> Great. <laughs> but I wasn't, very, I wasn't visible in any way. Nobody had any idea who I was. So I would linger around these reporters on the outside, listening very carefully for what uh, Speaker Mitchell was bringing up. And then I would take these notes, and then I would come back, and I would write up a brief for Senator Simpson and also for Senator Dole, and then it would go around. I'm not saying that I was, it wasn't clandestine, it wasn't like secret information, but it was incredibly good for me because I was having to listen to what he was saying, interpret what that meant to Republicans, and then go back and write a brief. And I did that day after day after day. And a kind of a throwaway job sort of became sort of one of the things that I was really good at, one of the things I was valuable for. And so to me, that's a good example of there's always jobs that come around that nobody wants to do. It's like, ugh, find somebody to do that. Don't always just kind of turn your nose up at those because if you're good, they turn into opportunities that didn't exist before. And I have a testimony of that in my own, in my own career. It's been helpful to me. Another example, when I first uh, was running Little Dickens, which is the name of that store that I had, like I said, there were no employees. So my partner and I were doing everything. That means taking out the trash. It means washing the windows. It means ordering. It means helping people. It means taking the deposit to the bank. And it also means cleaning up the bar from the three-year-old that was in the bathroom that nobody knew about. We went back there and like, oh, wow. But you know what? When you do that, you understand the business from the ground up. And I find that being able to, having to have to do everything was very useful. I started my career at humanitarian services as a shipping analyst, meaning stuff is stuck in customs in Peru and you gotta figure out a way to get it out. Nobody loves that job. It's a very thankless job, but I learned so much about international shipping and the dynamics that it takes. And do you know how often I use that now? I use it tons. Nobody wanted that job. That's why they were offering it to the temporary woman who was on the seventh floor. But I, I have really gotten a lot of opportunities that way. I had dinner with a friend of mine last night, and he, was, he has been a director. He has been lots of things, but he's now in a role where he's gone to a department. Nobody really knows what he did in the past. He's, you know, toward the end of his career. And people say along that department, well, let's have, our, let's have this guy do it and that guy do it, and let's get so-and-so to do this. He said they're never willing to be the one to roll up their sleeves and do the work. He said, I've... I've been there. I used to have somebody to do the IT and somebody to do the legal. He said, but now in this role, I want to be the one. I want to roll up my sleeves, go into the conference room, and figure it out on the whiteboard and then bring it back. He said, I want to be the one doing the actual work. And there's something really noble and empowering about that. So what do you get out of that? True talent, true ability is always going to rise to the top. And so be the one who's willing to do whatever because you will be noticed and opportunities will come your way that didn't exist before. That's, that's my first tip, for whatever it's worth. <laughs> the second tip is to worry about strengths and not about weaknesses. It's, it's critical for everybody to know what their own strengths are. And I know, 
I know a lot about what my strengths and my weaknesses are. But when you're in a new job, it's easy to feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't know how to do that. But it's much better if you focus on your strengths and what you can do. Because if you worry about how to mitigate your weaknesses all the time, you're not giving enough time to what you're good at. Let me give you an example. When I became the director of humanitarian services, uh, it was in sort of a tense political situation. And so I, I was appointed, and there were a lot of things that I didn't know about. The legal structure of LDS charities, which is extremely complicated in all of the countries. Uh, the, the budgeting system of the church, which was extremely different than my own business that I had worked. It's, it's international global banking and different funds and different requirements for different funds. And these were all my weaknesses, and that's all I could focus on. And so for weeks, I was poring over these, these different things. And I finally realized, I am if I study as hard as I can, I will never know what Patrick Reese, who is assisting me, knows in his head, in his little finger. And I, I realized, I need to focus on what my strengths are, and I need to leverage Patrick Reese for what his strengths are. And Patrick and I together make a pretty good team. And it dawned on me, if you can find out what people's strengths are and you know what your own strengths are, you start making these pairs and you put people together who complement each other, who strengthen each other. Patrick and I ended up working seamlessly for three years. I was so grateful to him because he'd worked at the church for 40 years. He'd seen it all and he knew all of that stuff. I didn't know any of that stuff. He was tremendously open to giving me counsel and advice. When he left, my first question, who's gonna be my Patrick Reese? <laughs> And then the second question is, what kind of a Patrick Reese can I be for somebody else? So that you, sh you end up mitigating your weaknesses by leveraging somebody else's strengths and making alliances with other people rather than trying to do everything yourself. That has been a tremendous help to me in my career. So I pass it on to you. The third thing is orange juice just isn't for, any orange juice just isn't for breakfast anymore. You are too young to remember this, but there was a campaign from the Florida orange growers that tried to get people to drink more orange juice. And the little tagline was, orange juice, it isn't just for breakfast anymore. And I would say, inspiration, it isn't just for church callings anymore. I have so benefited from using inspiration and revelation in work settings that maybe didn't ever lend themselves to being prayed over. And I have come to see you can pray about everything. That scripture in the Book of Mormon that says, uh, it will tell you all things what you should do, referring to the Holy Ghost, that has proved to be true. I have had lots of experiences where I have taken something to the, the Lord that I just don't know what to do about. And I've prayed about it, and I say even in the prayer, I know you don't care about these temporal worldly things, and I should be maybe smart enough to do this, or maybe this doesn't matter in the big eternal scheme of things, but I need the help. And the Lord is generous. He gives those that kind of help. I'll give you a couple of examples. I had been sent by the humanitarian department to uh, Sri Lanka. It was after the Southeast Asia tsunami. And it was a sad place. It was five months after the tsunami, but there were still ground up, terrible, littered cities everywhere. I mean, the destruction was just awful. And the people were still in post-traumatic stress syndrome. And lots of people were just completely shut down emotionally. And as we were driving from one city to another, we stopped at a place called, uh, I can't even remember the place, but the daily train that went from the capital, Colombo, to a place called Gaul went across the center of the island. And up into that train, knowing that the wave was coming, farmers and, and rural people had handed up their children up into the train through the windows because they knew it was high up off the track and it would keep the children safe. When the wave hit, that big car, and it's a, it's a giant train, it just tumbled the train in the wave and 1,700 people drowned inside the train. And so we stopped, got out, and the train's all wrecked, it's, dumped, it's dented and it's been tumbled, they set it back up. And there's all these families that are camped around there and they're camped because it was the last place that they were all together as a family. And somebody on a sheet has written it with paint and then stuck it up on the side of the train in, in some language. And I asked the interpreter, what does that say? And he said, we now understand the power of the sea because it took our children from us. So this is the situation that I'm going into. And I, 
I was emotionally overcome. I, it was so hard to be there, and it was so hard to have those people stroking my hands and touching, clutching at my sleeves and saying, you know, help me. I, I, they only know two English words, help me. I lost my baby. I lost my family. And just this, the, the rawness of that. And I didn't know what to do. I stayed in a filthy little place with bugs and no sheets. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and there's, there's fleas and there's, it, it just wasn't a good place to stay. But I woke up in the middle of the night and I just poured out my heart. What do I do, Heavenly Father? I can't express to them, you know, that we're here building a school that has no meaning for them. What is the right thing to do? And the image came into my mind that has always stayed with me. My interpreter was a guy named Shanta, and Shanta, he was from Sri Lanka. He spoke the language, he knew everything, and he, whenever we went anywhere, he'd go out with the kids and he'd bump fists with them and he'd kick a soccer ball around, and he, and I realized the thing that I'd said before, the place where I'm weak, I don't know the culture, I don't know the language, I can't express myself, Shanta is strong. And you leverage Shanta, he is, the, rather than just being the invisible interpreter driver, he's from this country. He will be the one to communicate the message. And from then on, I used him in every situation that we went to be the communicator, to, to not only just interpret my words, but to be the voice of what was happening there. I was so thankful for that little image that came into my head. I'm not, I'm not good enough to get whole paragraphs in my mind from the Holy Ghost, but I usually will get one idea that just sits in my head and waits for me to notice it. And when I notice it, I realize that's the answer to what I'm looking at. So that was an example. I, I've taken as my personal motto this scripture from Jacob. It's Jacob 2.17. And it says, Think of your brethren like unto yourselves, and be familiar with all and free with your substance, that they may be rich like unto you. And the reason I like that is because how will they be rich? How are people rich? Is it about money? If you are rich in brethren, think of your brethren like unto yourselves. If you're rich in a familiar spirit, that you have friends and you have people who understand you, be familiar with all and free with your substance. If you have substance to share, brethren, familiarity, and substance to share, that's what makes us rich. And that's my personal motto. And whether you're doing that in a career path, wherever you work, I'm lucky because I get to talk about these things as part of my job at the church. But it doesn't matter if you own your own business, if you work in government, if you work in a community, if you work in a big corporate structure. That little motto works for everybody. And I just want you to not be discouraged. I had every reason to be discouraged as a student. I wasn't very well prepared when I went out. And like I said, the Lord will guide you in what you need to do. And he knows you. He gets your strengths. And he's going to leverage your strengths and mitigate your weaknesses. So don't get discouraged as you look for work. And don't give up on your passions because you have those passions for a reason. And the Holy Ghost will guide you along. If he guided me into what I'm doing now, he will certainly guide you. And probably not the forum, but I'll just, I'll bear my witness that he cares enough about your work and your happiness and your confidence and your families than anything else on this planet. And that's what makes him God. He loves us as children. He loves us as a father. And that's maybe the best tip that I have. So I will end this by just, uh, asking if anybody has any questions. I won't probably be able to answer those questions, but I will point to other people in the room, and I'd be happy to answer anything that you have. Um, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you speaking to us. Um, Elias Charities, I've, I've thought of eventually having a career in Elias Charities, um, and the thing that I'm unsure about is how does Elias Charities promote sustainability? Um, you, you mentioned a little bit of it, but do you mind? No, I'm happy to talk about that. So there are s emergency response is what we're known for. And in emergency response, you're not going to do a lot of sustainability. This is about helping people in, in their extremity. They, they need water. They need clothing. They need blankets. Uh, they may have had all of those things, but they don't have them now for whatever reason. So emergency response is really about meeting a short-term need. As emergencies progress, they go into, how are we going to build up the infrastructure? So we worked a long time in the tsunami. 
uh, in the Philippines, in Japan after the tsunami, uh, in Haiti after the earthquake, trying to help people build back their houses and learn skills at the same time. So you will see uh, stuff in the church news or, or things in the desert news or some of the church videos about when you go back to rebuild and you're rebuilding infrastructure, everything about that is to teach people skills. So you want to teach construction skills, you want to teach budgeting skills, you want to teach going in and, and city planning and, and how. So they're looking for members of the church or others who can who don't have those skills, but they can learn them as we work to rebuild the community. So it becomes about self-reliance in a disaster situation. In the other six initiatives that we have, these are, these are built to transfer skills. So there's the wheelchair initiative, there's the vision care initiative, there's the immunizations, there's clean water, there's family gardening, and there is maternal newborn care. And we are doing those things on an ongoing basis, and we're working with mostly national partners, national governments, and yes, we're donating wheelchairs, but what we're really trying to do is to take an organization that works with people with disabilities and teach them, how do you find the people who have disabilities? How do you get them to come to you for services? What do you charge them? What if they can't pay? You donate the wheelchairs. How do you fit the wheelchairs? How do you repair the wheelchairs? How are you going to get wheelchairs when LDS Charities doesn't donate them? So you're going through, you're moving these partners along a spectrum as they move along. Same thing with immunizations or with maternal newborn care. We're donating the equipment, we're sending people, but the actual project is about skill transference and then connecting these professionals from all over the world. So we do a lot of work trying to connect our maternal newborn care partner in Kyrgyzstan with the same people in Lebanon, with the same people in Turkey, so that they develop a, a, a global network of people who are trying to do the same things that, that they're doing. And LDS Charities becomes the sort of the facilitator in that way. So you will hear the church talk a lot about self-reliance, trying to help people go from, from where they are and have the confidence and the ability and the skills transference to get to a new place. And in humanitarian projects, we're trying to do that same thing. We recognize that everybody talks about sustainability, but the best sustainability is teaching people skills so that they know how to do it themselves. And uh, I'll tell you the truth, in some instances like water, we're backing off because you can't change a community's water behaviors by sending in a missionary couple every two months. You have to be on the ground every single day dealing with the problems as they come up. So we aren't structured with our, with our volunteer structure to do that very well. So we have shifted some of our water work to partners who are on the ground who have made a commitment to be in that community for 10 years so they can actually change the actual behaviors and set up a water utility. So it's a very good question. We think about it all the time, and I hope you'll learn that and come work for us. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. As an LDS woman, what advice do you have for other LDS women um, looking forward to an involved career? Let me ask you to expand on the question. What is it about being an LDS woman that is, is part of that question? Why do you feel like that's, that's one of the things that you need to ask about? Um, cultural um, practices of women not being as involved in careers. There are some interesting uh, perceptions that we have sometime about women and careers, but you have a very interesting talk by Elder Cook, maybe two years ago, three years ago, and he basically told the whole church, please stop worrying about this. Let every couple make their choice, make their decision, and justify it for God, and then we'll all accept the revelation that they have been given. And if we would apply that that's been given to us by, a, by an apostle, I think we would stop worrying about each other and feeling judged or, or judging other people because everybody's situations are so different. And that's really a luxury for developed countries because in other countries, there's no question about people working. Everybody have to work. It's a matter of how do I make my family strong in this way. And as the church becomes a more global church, uh, not, not just in members but in, but in cultural practices, you will start to see that we have to leverage people's strengths. Now, we all know that the most important impact that a woman or a man has is what they do at home. And we want to protect and strengthen families so that they have plenty of parental time. And usually that is mothers in the home. But mothers still have to work in lots of instances. So we emphasize education so that you can work at something that's satisfying or you can work fewer hours or you can have flexibility. 
for, for women and for men, I think. As, as the global marketplace goes forward, those things will be important. Now, I'm a single woman, and I truthfully, when I came to the church, I thought, I wonder if that's going to get in the way. Because there, just call a spade a spade, there weren't a lot of women in leadership there. But all of that is changing. And I have had people who have mentored me. When I first took the job in LDS employment, it required all kinds of international travel. But the church had been a little bit skittish about, about uh, people traveling for, for very good reasons. They'd been burned in a lot of, of reasons. And I said, is travel going to be a, an issue? Because I don't want to accept the job. And they said, absolutely not. We've taken care of those issues. And they had. And so I appreciate the opening up of the church councils to the perspectives of men and women. And you can feel the apostles begging us, open up your councils, and, 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 but you also have to be prepared to act. You have to be prepared when you sit on that council to have something to say. And to say it in a, in a way that isn't brittle, it isn't combative, but is just is collegial because the ruling principle of the church is unity. The Lord says in the Doctrine and Covenants, if you aren't one, you aren't mine. And councils will wait until people feel all of one accord, which is, again, very interesting in the church. Most people, let's take a vote. But the highest councils will wait. If somebody has reservation, one person, then the council will wait until that has been resolved or they go in a different direction, which is very unusual in the whole world. We are practicing the council kind of leadership in a way that nobody else practices it. And we need to be good at doing it. And we need female and male perspectives in that. Was it helpful? Yes. Right, anyway. Any questions? Sure. So tell me a little bit about, you know, there's a world of need and a, you have limited resources. How do you get the most value out of your research? How do you make those decisions between the many possible things you could spend the resources on? Very good question. Uh, if you look up, Elder Pace has written a talk called Infinite Needs and Limited Resources, which he gives some beautiful things about this. But as we look around the world, we try to leverage in three ways. The first way is let's train trainers. Let's, let's go in and train other people who will have a ripple effect that goes out into the community. So we always try to train trainers for skill transference to have that multiplying effect. The second thing is we want to connect with permanent uh, community partners, people who are there all of the time, because the world has spent a ton of money and a ton of resource putting wells all over. But if you travel around, and lots of you have done this, there's a bunch of broken wells that nobody has taken care of. And that's just duplicating that effort over and over again. You want to rest your resource with somebody who values it, who takes care of it, and who knows how to fix it. And so that's the second thing. And the third thing is we want to be collaborative with other organizations from the global level, with UNICEF and United Nations High Commission for Refugees, all the way down to the municipality. We want to be collaborative with them so that what we're doing is, is not duplicated and is not what they didn't want. And so that, that what you actually do actually matters and actually fills in the gaps that you're trying to do. That's, that's sort of a broad picture about that. I, as a director, am also very cognizant of we're structured to do some things well. We're not structured to do other things well. And we better focus on the things that we do well. Volunteerism, we are, there's nobody in the world that is as good as volunteerism as we are. And the kinds of dedicated volunteers. Uh, the principles, when we bring in and we talk about self-help and we talk about self-reliance skills, nobody better than we are. Evaluation, we're terrible. So we always need to have somebody as another partner to come in and evaluate some of those things. So we're looking for partnerships to fill in our gaps. Along, sort of connected to that, that last one, um, how do you decide uh, at what point to withdraw from a situation? Like how do you decide, okay, they're, they're well enough off, they can sustain themselves? So you talked about how you go into um, areas where there's been a natural disaster and you stay for a long time. That's how you promote sustainability. How do you decide when to leave? In natural disasters, it's, it's not very cut and dried. You, you, you have to wait and see that um, the community systems that were up and going are, ab again, up and going. Sometimes they're improved. But if they're up to where they, they were before, that's sort of what we're after. But in other situations, and I'll, I'll use wheelchairs as an example, 
we used to donate wheelchairs to these partners, but we realized they will want you to donate wheelchairs forever. You know, they, they, they've just tapped into you, and then how do you age out of that? And we recognize we have to build up a structure so that when you lay the expectations with a partner, you sit down and you say, we're going to work with you for five to seven years. And in that five to seven years, you need to be able to hit these benchmarks, and we're going to help you. But be, and you're going to get to this point. And then we will open up our discounts at the factory, and we'll open up our buying group to you, and we'll teach you how to raise donations and, and uh, have people who can pay you know, do these means testing. But you're going to have to have a lot of work in this. You're going to have to change your system so that you can progress. Are you interested in that kind of a partnership? Are you, is this the right time in your organization? Not that you're just so bad you'll say no, but sometimes it's premature. They're just not strong enough. We're, we're looking for the partners who are at the right stage in their organization to take that kind of a leap. And as sad as it is, we turn down other partners because they're not, not prepared for that. We'll still do emergency, you know, we'll still help them in emergencies, but that transformational change to becoming sustainable is the bread and butter of our initiatives. And so we're looking for partners who are in that sweet spot to be able to do it. People are leaving. I just want to say thank you very much for having me. It is so gratifying to come back to BYU and see the quality of students and what you will do in the world. And, and maybe you'll hire me when I'm in my, my dotage and come along. Anyway, thank you very much for having me.